welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much, man. Good to be here. I am super excited to dig into this. I have so many different directions I want to go in. Um, I think a I think a good place to start would be in New Hampshire. My um, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about you, New Hampshire people. My wife is from Manchester, New Hampshire. And when she saw my notes that I wrote uh, New Hampshire on the top of the page, she goes, well, what's New Hampshire about? I said, well, this, this dude I'm interviewing is from New Hampshire. She's like, where, where, where exactly? I don't know what it is about New Hampshire people. They love New Hampshire people. W- what is that all about? Well, I got to tell you, man, I live in Maine. I've been here but since you're from I was New- 15 from there, years right? old. Yeah. And so my my whole thing all the time is trying to convince Mainers that I'm like legit because <laughs> <laughs> if you're not born in Maine, you know, even if you were conceived in New Hampshire and you you were born in Maine, it's still kind of not legit. So uh, but this whole area, you know, when you get north of Massachusetts for me and you get uh, east of Vermont, I really like that part of the country a lot. So, yeah, I grew up in New Hampshire I'm from Dover originally. And Dover. Uh, so kind of down by the coast, you know, and um but it is a funny thing being a Mainer now, because, you know, this is where my heart really is. I've been here, you know, more than half my life. But uh, but I love this whole area. But the thing about Maine, too, is like being in Maine, it's not great to be from out of state, but it's being from New Hampshire is a lot better than being from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island or New York. So I have that going for me. Well, it's really funny you said that because I'm from New York and my wife and I have been married 15 years and we still we still have that new hampshire new york uh debate so I, I, I'm, I'm i'm right there with <laughs> yeah. you i want yeah. to talk to you a little bit about um the beginning of your life um and uh and your childhood uh specifically um could you describe maybe a bit we don't have to go you know crazy on the couch here but what was it like for you um you know let's say the earlier years of your childhood so maybe a little snapshot of what that was like yeah, they were really uh, difficult and confusing years, I, I got to say. They, there were mixed blessings thrown in, but I, I did grow up around uh, mental illness and kind of psychological abuse and, and things like that, um, substance abuse. And, um, you know, talking to my wife about it last night, I grew up in a place where, you know, I'm in a world now where, let's say, outbursts of anger are seen as a weakness. But where I grew up, they were how you demonstrated strength. Uh, it's kind of an interesting, you know, dilemma. I was in a world where if you were a really self-centered jerk, that was better than just going with the flow because just going with the flow led to, you know, poverty, you know, drug addiction, jail, you know, all those kind of places. So, so uh, you know, a lot of the, the survival skills that I developed as a child uh, don't translate well into my life today, uh, but they kind of got me out of that world. But um, it was also really confusing, uh, because I've always had um, a real connection to my heart, my soul, my spirit, and I believed in edification, and I believed in, um, I guess, self actualization. But the world I was in those the tools for that weren't really available. And I always thought it was really strange, I would watch what people um, were interested in, what they did, what they chose, what they bought, what they sold, like all those kind of things. And nothing made sense to me. I knew there had to be more. It was just that um, the way class works, and I don't, I'm not coming at the, I'm not an activist. I'm not like, oh, classism. Um, I'm just saying like class is an actual thing. And when you're in a tier, like a socioeconomic tier, it's like you don't know other worlds exist outside of what you see in television or movies. Is I didn't I didn't encounter people with success or emotionally healthy lives or good. I, it wasn't until my late thirties that I even knew that there was such thing as good marriages. I mean, I just didn't know that, you know. And that sounds so naive, but I mean, I had no examples of it. Um, you know, of what to me, family was like a negative had a negative connotation until really late in my life. It's so strange now because I see the world really from a different perspective. Um, But I grew up in a hard world and um, I developed a lot of skills that are incredibly beneficial to me now, but um, I had to learn how to rework them into something usable. That makes sense. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I've always ascribed, I, I think I invented this. It's kind of like nature, nurture, and neighborhood. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like your, mm-hmm. your environment Really, like I, for example, I live in uh, Florence, Italy. That's where I am right at this moment, and it's 
you know, like I, it, everything, your environment really, really dictates so much about how you think. So I, I get that. One of the, um, <clears throat> one of the tools um, that you used or one of the, one of the things that you stepped into early in your life to sort of alter things for you was to use food. So mm. you went, <clears throat> you went all in on becoming a vegan, right? Um, and I don't see a vegan in front of me right now, but we're going to, we're going to get into, we're going to get into that. Um, you were, uh, you were, you were the vegan star, right? Uh, you, that you were booked to do speeches, the conferences, the whole bit. Um, but then, then they kicked you out of the nest and they said, no, this is, he's not the vegan we want talking about us. Could you tell me a little bit more about that portion of your story? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a little bit of a caricature. It went a little different than that. But um, but I did uh, probably about age, let's say about age 16. So I grew up kind of, uh, you know, I had no dad and no real male role models. And, you know, my mom was not somebody into healthy living. And uh, I was always out of shape, you know, always a little overweight, um, not grossly, but, you know, I was kind of a kid in the gym class who'd get picked on type of kid. Yeah. And um man, it all kind of started with a girl, you know, when I was 16. And this girl invited me to spend the evening at her house. And man, I just had no self confidence. And the next day, I was like, I'm going to the gym. I got a gym membership. And that led me to be like, Oh, it matters what I eat. And then I'm an autodidact. So very quickly, I went deep, way past like men's fitness magazine nutrition, I went deep, deep, deep. And, you know, this era we're talking about, I would have been 16. So, you know, back then, I'm in my mid 40s now. Back then, there, you know, vegetarianism was synonymous with healthy living. This is pre primal, pre carnivore, pre, you know, keto, pre Atkins, like none of that had happened yet. So vegetarianism was the idea. And it, it honestly just made a lot of sense to me. And I started there. That got me into veganism. And then really quickly, I got into raw foods. It was right at the beginning of the internet. And I had access to, you know, at that time, a lot of web pages were some pretty far out characters who were early adopters, you know? Yep. So I learned a lot about that. I went really deep into that world and uh, kind of rose through the ranks of it, I guess you could say. And I was at the conferences and the events and I was in the kitchens and I was a big part of it. Um, I wasn't a vegan when I started public speaking. So it's a misconception people have about me. I'd already kind of transitioned out of that, but I was a talented speaker. So I'd be asked and booked to come to these events and speak to vegans. And I was like on this transition out of that world. And so for years, it kind of worked. I was in this gray area. And there would be things I'd say that the, they wouldn't like, but, you know, I just kept pushing, pushing, pushing uh, until I was sort of driven out of those worlds and out onto my own, which was fantastic for me today. Of course, you know, I'm like a hunter gatherer. Um, I know a lot about plants that folks in the hunting world don't know because of my time as a vegan. I learned, I made, I forged relationships with species in the plant kingdom that are still really valuable to me today. Um, but it's been awesome uh, to sit back and watch the pendulum swing from vegetarianism and veganism as being synonymous with healthy living to this idea of like egg yolks, butter, and meat is now like the health food. It's just hilarious because where I sit now, I go, oh, you know, this is what everything, every topic, pick, pick any subject matter. And what Western culture does is TikTok between obnoxious caricatures on either side. We do it politically. We do it socially. We, everything is this way, right? It's like the country is, you know, censorship and then it's all free speech and then that's too much. So it goes back to censorship and we just, we just kind of do this toggle thing. So I learned that through this process with food. Um, but I also learned food is a extremely powerful, if not one of the most powerful transformational tools, at least in my toolkit, my arsenal. And uh, I was able to use food you know, even though I don't subscribe to the diets that I was into then, I was able to use food to change my life. And I've been able to watch, I mean, literally tens of thousands of people over the years, you know, I mean, I sincerely can really have watched tens of thousands of people who've transformed their lives by becoming, by, by going off of autopilot with food and becoming conscious of the, taking the wheel and learning that you can do that teaches you that you can do other things 
um, and that you also like exercise. If somebody's never exercised, you know, the first couple of weeks suck, but a month in, you're starting to see results. And those results motivate you. And food's the same way. You start to change your relationship to food. You see results that drives you onward. And so I learned, I think food was the first place I really learned that I could change my life radically and that um, I could control the trajectory that I was on. Because prior to that, like I said, sort of growing up, just was in a groove where it was really difficult to get up out of the groove and set a new course. Um, but food was my tool that I was able to do that with. You, you read a book by a dentist and that book had a significant impact on you, right? Where you're like, I, I, I just, I'm seeing things differently right now. What was the title of the book? What was the, the point in your life where you read it? What made you pick, pick it up? Like, talk me through, because every, it sounds, it sounds to me based on the, my research that that moment was a hockey stick moment for you where you, everything just shifted. Did I get that right? Yeah, you did. Your research is interesting, man. Uh, yeah, you're onto it. So I read a book called uh, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration by a doctor called Weston Price. And Weston Price was like a turn of the century dentist. And his interest was, um, well, I think it started for him, you know, a lot of people don't realize the term quack comes from the German quicksilver, you know, which means mercury. And a quack was a, a dentist who was putting mercury in people's teeth. Because wow. you got to understand in metallurgy, um, we're getting into anthropology here, but, but mercury is one of the first metals people learn how to access because it has such a low melt point. It's one of the only substances on the planet outside of water that's a liquid at room temperature. So people very quickly learned how to extract mercury from cinnabar and learned very early on about its toxicity. So in other words, its toxicity was well known. A lot of people know that a mad hatter, mad as a hatter, comes from the fact that mercury was used in the processing of top hats. And it was understood that people who worked with mercury industrially often developed you know, cognitive problems. So a mad hatter. So um, the idea that you would take mercury and actually put it in someone's mouth, you know, as a, an amalgam filling was considered at the time, like, hey, this is crazy because we know this is dangerous for you. So he was going, hey, what? No, instead of what do we fill people's teeth with? He's interested in why are we filling people's teeth? I mean, like, why do we all have a bone disease so early on in our life? Because teeth are bones, they're modified bones. Why would we have a disease that causes, you know, basically osteoporosis of the teeth? What is this? So he went around the world, left Europe, traveled around the world, went to all of these indigenous cultures that were still either on a traditional life way kind of diet or had been just recently transitioning to Western diets. And he also went to some very rural areas to look at sort of traditional life ways of people in Scandinavia and places like that. And what he found was the modern diet was causing, you know, problems in dentition. But what he also discovered was that when you looked at people who were still on traditional diets, they didn't, it wasn't just that they didn't have cavities, it was that their dental arch was broad and their teeth didn't crowd the way that we're used to seeing now. Again, that's a bone disease. So, you know, if you grew up in such a way that your ribs were all mismatched and not fitting, we would easily recognize that you had a structural misalignment. But in teeth, we just act like that's a normal thing, like as if our teeth just grow in crooked. And then we do a surgical process, right, where we put in these uh, braces and then we restructure it and we pretend like there's no problem. But he realized this is a degenerative illness and that it's rooted in nutrition. It's actually rooted in a lack of, of fat soluble vitamins and water soluble vitamins. So my interest in food wasn't just um, like, what should I eat to be, you know, what do I eat for six pack of abs? It was, it was, my interest was what is the human animal's natural diet? I, I think this is so obvious to anybody like, like, let's say you're a zookeeper and you need to keep, you know, the hippos healthy. You don't just throw dog food at them. You ask yourself, what do the wild hippos in Africa eat? And then you try to simulate that diet for them. So it was like, well, if I just know what people are supposed to eat, then I can simulate the right diet for me. I don't care what science thinks they figure out about food. I don't care about like newfangled 3D printed, you know, whatever, like perfectly dialed macronutrient synthetic foods. I want the food that human beings as an animal ate prior to, you know, agriculture. That's what I was interested in. I thought that was plant foods. That's why I was a vegan. 
I got sold this idea of like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden picking fruits. That's all they ate. Why would you eat anything else? And why would you kill something? It's hard to do. I didn't understand anthropology at the time. That book made me realize, oh, there are no vegetarian or vegan in indigenous cultures. All humans are hunter gatherers. The only vegetarian culture to ever exist is post agricultural in India supplemented with dairy foods from animals, liquid meat. So I quickly realized that I had been on the wrong trajectory and it realigned me. But what really shifted for me was actually is the photos in the book where he just shows you people's dental arches and he shows you, you know, people's teeth. And uh, it was incredible to see, you know, grandpa's teeth compared to his son's teeth compared to his son's teeth as they adopted Western diets. And you just saw not only did they get cavities, but they got dental crowding and sometimes separation, um, you know, in the soft palate too. So hard palate, I mean, so that was pretty moving for me. Did you find as you went from the, well, did you jump right into um, a new way of eating immediately or was it a slow process? It was a bit of a process. Um, I was really reinventing the wheel. And like I said, access to the information today, you know, today, the idea of like uh, biologically appropriate diets or anthropologically based diets, there's, I mean, you just stop in any airport bookstore and there's eight books on the topic. This is like, so it's, it's kind of like when you talk to kids uh, who grew up with the internet and with phones and they just can't imagine you going to the library and using a card catalog Today, talking about these things, it's like, it seems to a young person like, yeah, this is an obvious concept, ancestral diets. We all, it's like really obvious if you're into nutrition, this is what, now it's in Men's Health Magazine or whatever, you know? It was not common thought back then. There was sort of a pervasive idea that meat was generally bad for you, that soy protein was generally good for you. There was like a lot of confusing ideas back then. So I didn't have like a community to jump into or people to be like, oh yeah, I'm into that too. So I kind of had to reinvent the wheel. So I think I started eating butter and, uh, and dairy products. And then I started eating, you know, fish and then I started eating birds and then I started eating, you know, red meat. And uh, it was a slow process. Yeah. Was there, you know, if I, I'm not a vegan. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm actually the opposite. I don't go this way or that way. I just, I live in Italy and sometimes it's pasta. Sometimes it's fish. Sometimes it's, I just, whatever the fuck I want. To I'm eat, no right? more. <laughs> I just, I just eat whatever I want to eat. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's how I do it. So I don't, I, I have truly no agenda here. Um, mm -hmm. But did you, let me ask it this way. When I go out and like, if I have some grilled vegetables or something, I usually feel a little better than if I stuff myself on some other stuff that's not so good for me. I would suspect that when you went from this clean, I'm going to use the word clean, you know, you, when you went from that to the other, what was the changes you felt like in your energy, in your sleep, in how you felt? Was it, were you improving? What did you feel sluggish? What was the change like? We got to understand like the context here is that I'm not really into processed foods, you know, okay. uh, as people mean it. <laughs> it's a, lot, a whole nother story. But uh, yeah, so I eat a really whole food diet, you know. So for me at the time, transitioning to those foods, it wasn't like I started eating French fries and felt really sluggish from that. Or, I, you know, a big bowl of pasta is going to knock me out. I mean, if I ate a big bowl of pasta right now, I'm probably taking a nap after, right? Got it. But, you know, I'm not, I don't have that issue if I eat, you know, a piece of meat or, you know, a, a bird or, or vegetables. Like it's not, it. so I didn't experience that. What I had was a lack of protein, a lack of like quality protein in my life. So the results for me were just awesome. <clears throat> Got and it. Um, I think in particular, I wasn't doing, you know, I'm not somebody who's into doing a lot of blood testing and those kind of diagnostics, but I would imagine there were real surges in my testosterone levels when I began to eat meat again. You know, I certainly experienced um, increased vigor, let's say. Yeah, yeah, um, no, I get it. But I get it. now, also fair to say, though, <clears throat> you know, if you went tomorrow on a vegan diet, you're probably going to feel amazing for like six months. It's just that it after a while, you start to run out of stores, you're drawing off your brain, your fat soluble vitamins in your liver, you're spending off the bank account. And at some point you look at the account balance and it's really low and I, you don't notice it at first. And so my accounts started to fill back up and I started to feel great. 
Got it. That's exactly what I was looking for. You're, you're a good metaphor guy. I see why you're a great speaker. That was perfect. <laughs> um, what Thank is you. what is rewilding? Yeah, well, we kind of are sort of dancing around it right now. So let's say uh, we take your dog. Let's imagine that you have a pug or a chihuahua, right? And uh, that chihuahua is domesticated. <laughs> domesticated is Latin. It just means of the house. Um, now, your pug is actually scientifically is a gray wolf. It's not like a gray wolf. It's not a related species. It's the species gray wolf, Canis lupus. That's the gray wolf that's, you know, we find all around the, the temperate northern latitudes of the world. Okay. That animal can be domesticated into the modern dog of which there's something like 500 varieties. They're all subspecies of gray wolf when we turn it into a dog call it canis lupus familiaris so most of us know that the the linnaean binomial naming system for things it gets two names a genus and a specific epithet we call that a species so we're homo sapiens but when we add a third name usually that's to denote it's a trinomial that's to denote a subspeciation so we'll say the the wolf is canis lupus the dog is canis lupus familiaris now you look at the pug and you don't see a wolf there really. Yep. And if you put that pug out on the landscape, it's going to be food for something. It can barely breathe. It doesn't know how to feed itself. It doesn't know how to stay warm. It's lost all of the adaptations to its environment. You know, you were talking before about neighborhood and it's a good metaphor here because the trust fund, the, the lazy, pale trust fund video game kid is hyper adapted to his environment. It's fitness. He's not adapted to the world you live in or I live in, and he's not adapted to the outside, but he is adapted to his condo with, uh, it's actually supremely adapted to his virtual world and his, does that make sense? Like, a, a I'm just, pug I'm, is actually I'm just, I'm just specialized. Blown, I'm blown away by the use of those, those six words. Lazy pale trust fund video kid. That, like, we can end it right there. That was word. <laughs> you got it all now. That was you word conservation. Going? Like, I I'm still like, I you had me at hello. On that. that was <laughs> really good. Really good. Sorry. Go okay, ahead. I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> well, what I'm trying to say is your pug is really adapted to your, let's say, your Italian townhouse. He's yeah. just not adapted to being actually on the planet anymore. He's yep. adapted to the built environment. So it's a gray wolf that's been changed. Similarly, Homo sapiens sapiens, that's our current form. We're a species that's 300,000 years old based on current archaeology and genomics. And we are from a lineage, Homo, that's a couple million years old. Only in the last really few thousand years have we gone through this really radical transformation to living in the built environment and to, to becoming so domesticated. And like the pug, most of us don't know how to feed ourselves, clothe ourselves, or even actually spend time out in our natural environment anymore. Our natural environment isn't the built environment. We're actually made for living outside. And, and not, I don't just mean like in the savannas of Africa. I mean, human beings are adapted to living in the polar regions, in the equatorial regions, and everywhere in between. I mean, we're incredibly adapted to a huge range of habitats prior to agriculture. Yep. But most of us today are really domesticated. We are really ill fit for anywhere out. We're supremely adapted to, we're fit for the built environment, for the mall, for the office, for the home. But you put us outside and we carry so much equipment that we look like astronauts going to another planet. Yep because we act like our natural habitat is a foreign and hostile world. We need, so if you were to take like, let's say you went to the Amazon, right? And you took an Amazonian native person and an astronaut, and then you took like your average backpacker, climber, trekker person, and you put them, do they look more like the native or more like the astronaut? I mean, the huge backpack, the all shiny exterior Gore-Tex suit, the boots, the crampons, that they all this stuff, like as if Earth's this foreign world we're visiting. There's a lot of there's a lot of very serious drawbacks to this modern lifestyle that we're beginning to realize are not just little things. They're actually, I think, on a planetary level, especially in especially in the parts of the world where we sit at the top of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. 
and we've gone to the level of self-actualization, we're now realizing it's actually crisis mode. I mean, the governments of the world are scrambling to rewild the planet. That's actually what's happening. So, um, you know, at the top, top levels of governance, I don't really like top town governance. What I like is the idea of sort of um, an auto directed rewilding of oneself where we, we say, hey, how do I become more fit for my planet? I want to be able to like be healthy and fit in the outdoors. I don't want to just be adapted. Like a lot of people from our generation are not well adapted to the virtual world. We have a level of technology where we can't, we don't really know how to go beyond. You know what I mean? We're like, ah, it's, I don't get that. Like I can, I can use zoom, but I, you know, I don't, I I'm terrible at modern video games and I don't, you know, I'm not real interested in the metaverse. Like it's just not interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not well adapted to the virtual world. I'm pretty adapted to the built environment, the mall, the house, the bank. And I'm pretty adapted to the, to the natural world. There's like three worlds we're living in today, right? A virtual one, a built one, and the natural one. Most people are more adapted to the built and virtual. And if they go into the, the natural world, they go into it with the hopes of if something happens, they'll be rescued. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, oh, I'm, like I'm, if you I'm, watch I'm a survival show, it's like, I'm absolutely that survival guy. shows are like rescue me, right? Everything is about like, how long can you survive until you get found? Because we are like the pub. <laughs> so rewilding is saying what skills do I need? What adaptations do I need to start to become a fully natural human again? which is not, I'm not into the abandonment of the other worlds, the built or the virtual. I just think it's a, it's a extremely vulnerable position and a, and a tremendous weakness to not be adapted to your own planet. It puts you in, um, a, a, there's a terrible sense of deep loneliness for persons that have no relationship to non-human persons of which the world is filled. And so one of the things about domesticated people is they don't know species of trees. They don't know species of grasses. They don't know forbs. They don't know animals. If you take a kid in New York City and you ask them about animals, studies show they'll mostly tell you about animals from Africa, but they won't know about the brook trout in the streams where they live. They won't know about the bird species in their own backyard. And if they do know animals from their environment, the studies also show they typically have a negative um, feeling about them. They think they're dirty, dangerous, and diseased. Oh yeah, there's raccoons, but they're, they have rabies. So there's rats, they're, they're dangerous and dirty. So people are living in such a way like that everything in the natural world is hostile. And that makes humans very lonely because for those 300,000 years of our evolution as a species, we knew all the species around us. We knew how to use them. We knew how to interact with them. We knew how to grow them. We knew how to eat them. That was, we were interrelated. And today humans are out on a limb all alone, like, like as if this is a colony on Mars. And so wanna, rewilding is reversing that. I got it. I got it. It's a great explanation. I, I want to ask you a question. And if you don't want to answer it, just tell me I don't want to answer it. But there's mm -hmm. some there's something there's there's a there's a there's a, a point that keeps popping up in my head as you're describing this world that we're living in right now. I'm I'm 55 years old. And I am watching a very strange thing happen before my eyes. And that is people not identifying with gender. It's a weird thing. I can't, I can't understand it. I, I don't know why it's we and they. Yes, you can. I don't. Yes, you can. You but I, but I really, I really, 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 I, I tell you where I want to go with it. I want to go with like the, the pussification of America is like what like pops in my head, if I'm honest. But I really, really would love your opinion if you're willing to, you know, tack a super controversial one. Because I, I, like, I, again, I don't have an agenda. I truly am. Not, I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, again, remember that these kids are adapted to the environment they're in. So you're seeing an adaptation to the environment, right? That's one thing I want to say that it looks like pussification, mm -hmm. but 
actually, these people are more fit in the modern social environment than you and I are. We're the uh, dinosaurs now with our old way of thinking. Now, I, it's not that I agree with this way of thinking. I want to be clear. Like, I have trans friends and I love people. So this isn't about... I don't care really. Yeah, me too. But I me also too. believe in biology and the idea that when I when I watch David Attenborough describe wildlife, he shows you the males and the females. Right. And there's never this or extremely rarely are there any cases of like what somehow are humans animals or not? Are we from this planet or not? Are we are we ancient astronauts from somewhere else? Cuz if so, okay, maybe, but here on earth things are pretty gender polar. So, and of course there'll be arguments here. People will say that all gender and sex are different. That's a very modern mental construct in my opinion, but they'll say, oh, you're talking about sex, male, female, not gender, male, female. Gender is a thing you identify with, blah, blah, blah. I believe that with 7 billion people on the planet immersed in plastics and other um, substances that, uh, affect our gender development. Um, I think in a world of incredible um, opulence, the level of wealth we're living with today, this has happened in other cultures, right? You start to see this kind of andro... Yeah, you start to see androgyny a lot of times. Um, uh, how, how do you say it? Fashionable androgyny start to emerge uh, when cultures are at the peak of what they're capable of achieving before their declines. Like, it, look, at the, look at the hieroglyphs of Egypt and you see this sort of androgyny in these lithe body types. You know what I'm talking about? And then that culture goes away. You know what I'm saying? We've reached this point where I think that uh, you're, more, you're in a way more fit by being androgynous. We are in a mismatch of, of every kind of time period and fashion trend, everything's all mixed together. We're in this time where, where you, you wear a top from the 70s and pants from the 60s and a hat from the 90s and the music is from the 80s and everything's all just like mixed together. We're mixing all of the, the things that used to exist in discrete categories mm -hmm. because we've reached a time where we are no longer relying on the wisdom of our ancestors. We're no, for, we're no longer reliant on each other for survival and where the ego dominates. And in that environment, self-expression becomes, you got to understand that for 300,000 years, humans lived in tribal environments where the number one taboo is the expression of ego. Number one thing, everything's about the collective, not the individual. Now, in this environment we've created, which is um, like an like a inversion or a mirror of the world that we come from, it's the extreme opposite. Everything's about the expression of the individual. And we're in a time where every virtue is being corrupted. That, that's the, what we're exploring. It's postmodernism is another way to say it, right? We've reached this postmodern time. We're about to step into a world. Now, keep this in mind too. I mean, you see this. So you, you know what I mean when I say metaverse? That's Zuckerberg's latest do, well, I'm, new I'm, thing ass that he's I, I, I'm assuming that like, are you pushing it all the way to the boundaries of like Elon Musk talking about like, we're going to like, you know, like our consciousness Prior to that, is going to go. The newest thing, but prior, yeah, Zuck before that, the in, next, in, the next his step, new Zuckerberg's company. new thing is, is basically instead of meeting like this, you and me can have this podcast under the Eiffel Tower, we'll be wearing Glasses. virtual headsets and you will choose whatever body you want that day. You will choose whatever hair you want. You'll choose whatever clothes you want virtually like somebody setting up a video game avatar mm -hmm. in that world. What will gender matter anymore? You want to be male. You want to be female. You want to be in between. You want to be a lizard person. You want to be a panda bear. You want to be a butterfly, be a bacteria. You'll get to choose day by day. You'll be able to come to your meetings as whatever you want to be. So we're in this stage right now where people are, it's almost like, it's almost like if we were going to get on ships to go to Mars tomorrow as a, as a species, like the whole civilization was going to get on ships to go to Mars, there would be a whole preparation that you'd be doing at home to get ready for that transition. Similarly, as humans are getting ready to leave the natural world, or if they think they are, to go into the virtual world, all of these norms that couldn't be violated before suddenly can be violated. The way people are going to live trans lives is probably not through physical surgeries. Do you remember back in the 80s, like 
right now they're doing that, but soon they won't need to do that because they're going to be in that virtual world so much. They'll just be able to choose the body. Do you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's sort of like thinking back to um, back in the eighties, all the movies, remember the cyborgs, all yeah. the cyborgs always had like wounds where there'd be like shit stuck into them, cords and pipes and yep. tubes. Now we know, okay, that we don't really need to do. A lot of things will just be augmented. You'll just wear technology. You won't need the technology actually cutting into your skin. That would lead to infection and medical problems. We didn't know then. We had a crude way of thinking. I think that's where we're at with this gender thing. It's an expression of where we're headed with the virtual stuff. And we're trying to bring it into reality right here today. But uh, as people, I mean, how many, how many kids does your grandmother have? Mine had nine. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay. Mine had nine. My mom had three. I have none. When reproduction is no longer the focus, when you no longer need a dozen kids to run your farm, when fertility rates are tanking, I'm sure you're hip to sure. the degree to which you know, sperm and egg are damaged today. Um, when you no longer need males to go out and acquire protein and females to care for the house, like all of these norms get drawn. I'm, I'm not with this program, but I'm just saying I can see the landscape. And the, the reason that it's so hard to go find a good, like masculine action movie today is because, you know what I mean? Like every action movies now a female action star it's like it's incredible because there's no longer any need for the, that kind of masculinity today so it's been called into question and to you and me it looks like this what you call the pussification because we're going like i know that's not real right how long can it be like this but remember that when civilizations are at the peak they think that they're they think it can go on forever and when you think it can go on forever is usually when it's at the end. Whether oh, it's it was... with uh, the guy who won Megabucks or it's with, you know, the Egyptian civilization, you know, or the Greeks or the Romans. I mean, keep in mind, they all, they have all fallen. There is yet to be a civilization that's gone on. Every civilization has collapsed. And we are at a really, really incredible crossroads. And we think we're going to be able to go on forever. But at some point, it's not just masculinity we're going to need back. We're going to need femininity back too. Uh, both are going to be called upon. And um, I just hope that um, some of us can be almost like a Noah's Ark and keep some of those virtues of the past alive so that when they're called upon and needed, that they're present still. I hope that's not too vague, but that's kind of how I see it. <laughs> God, there was no part of that that was vague. That was unbelievable. I literally want to just go back and re-listen to that whole thing. That was so damn good. You know, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll just touch on this, and then we, we'll move on. Um, but being here in, in Italy, I've been uh, here for four months, and uh, I moved from L.A. So, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Dude, I can't even tell you. Like, it is yeah. so strange now when every now and again something will come across my Instagram or Facebook feed where I'll look at it and I'll go like, what the fuck is that? Like, what, like, what is that? Like, what is that? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like, there's no, th this does not, there's no conversation of it here. It doesn't exist here. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's interesting. I want to talk to you about, <clears throat> um, we went from vegans, we went into rewilding. And if I look at your Instagram, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of animals <laughs> who are no longer on the planet. Um, what was it like for you? when you i don't want to make this too graphic but what was it like for you the first time that you i'll keep it simple what was it like for you the first time you hunted yeah it's amazing um yeah well first if you look at anybody's meal plan there's a lot of animals that aren't on no, the no, anymore. no got it yeah absolutely um, but, but but they're uh, not but they're I, going but to I, but they're I'm going to burger king Right. So I'm in it. I think that's yeah. kind of really at the heart of your question because I'm right in it. And yep. so I watch, uh, you know, I was, um, I'm in post-production for the second season of my TV show. So I'm watching an episode last night um, and doing the voiceover for it. And I kill a bison on the Standing okay. Rock Reservation in, um, in North Dakota, South Dakota. And when this bison dies, um, I'm right there with my hands on it and tears come out of its eyes. Mm -hmm. And my wife's with me. 
and she's crying. And there's a, a friend of mine, Travis and a, a Dakota um, guy from the reservation who's um, he's saying prayers in Dakota. And you feel almost like as if you were watching now this changes based on the size of the animal. I hate to, I know, I know it sounds hierarchical, but it's like, if I kill him, when you kill a mosquito, you probably, you know, like if I cry. asked you like, how'd you feel the first time you killed a mosquito? You're like, dude, don't even remember. Yeah. But if I was like, what about the first time you killed a dove? It's like, oh yeah, that, I remember that. What about the first time you killed a bison? Well, I can't forget that. Or the first time you kill a bear, it's like, okay, I can't forget that. Some, yep. for some reason, the bigger, the more anthropomorphic, yep. whatever. But it's almost like a Marvel movie or something where like a, like a magic vortex opens to another dimension. When you're there with something dying like that, it's like, I don't know. It's like your normal waking state. It's an altered state of consciousness. And when you get to be intimate with death, like frequently, mm -hmm. you get used to entering that state of consciousness. Like maybe an, a shaman who, you know, who gives ayahuasca in the Amazon and every time he gives ayahuasca, he drinks it. He gets very comfortable after a time to go into that altered state. And maybe the participants are new to it. So they're having their minds blown. And he knows how to navigate in that space. You know, like the surfer, the first time they get up on a wave, you couldn't, if you were like, how did it feel? It's like, I don't know, it was exhilarating. But they don't have time to think about what to do before they fall. Yep. You know, but after a while, now you're up and you're thinking. And eventually you have like a unconscious competence. Yep. It's like that. The more um, actual killing you do, I'm talking, you know, for the context of food and talking about animals, obviously. Um, the more you do that, the more you get to be present with that space and you realize that it's more, it feels to me anyway, it's more than just protein or more than just nutrients that come to me. You feel like a rend in something spiritual where a spirit's like leaving the world and its energy is getting going to be transferred to you. And you take possession of something that was sovereign moments before and is now your possession in a way. Mm. The body of that animal becomes your possession. It's a, mm. And it was the sovereign possession of some entity that's no longer there. So it's very powerful. You know, I mean, I could give you little trite things. Oh, it's sad. Oh, I, I feel this or whatever. But I'm, it's a mix of a lot of things. It's exhilarating and there's like a ecstatic feeling <clears throat> there's acquisition. So as somebody who's gone after goals and achieved them, you know, like if you've been hunting for something and you acquire that thing, boy, there's that deep satisfaction. There's incredible emotional sadness. I mean, watching something die, you have, um, you know, like your, uh, what's the word? Like your mirror neurons fire and you're you see and you realize your mortality so your mortality fears are triggered like oh i'm meat too i'm temporary like that like whatever i am i'm not the all of the carbon and all of these minerals that i've that's just what i've accumulated in possessions but that's not me because here's that animal all his carbon all his water all his nutrients and are there still, but he's not there anymore. She's not there anymore. So it triggers your sense of that you will die. And that's a little scary. Um, but it also puts you, it's that rewilding thing. It puts you right back in the driver's seat. Uh, you go from being the pug to something a little more like the wolf where you, you realize, you know, men are predators. <laughs> Let's just don't know how to say that another way. If yeah. we don't predate on animals, we'll predate on something else. So, you know, if you're in business, you've seen predators or been one, you know, sure. if sure. you were been in the dating scene, you've been a predator and you've seen them, you know, men that it's almost like going back to the gender thing. You know, I know that the roles have changed today, but traditionally for 300,000 years, kind of traditionally women nurture life, men take life. That's how the game works. Now, today, there's tremendous amount of women hunters, excellent women hunters. So this is not, not to take away from that. It's to say that the roles have changed. But traditionally, women spend all their time making sure things stay alive. And the men go away to take life away, whether it's to defend the tribe against other humans or it's to take animals. And then they bring those back. And there's overlap, of course, but men are typically not super good at the nurturing of things. And women are not usually... You know, it's hard for my wife every time I kill something to see it. It's hard for her. 
But, you know, but she works with children and it's like, she can do that all day. So partially there's something very satisfying about reawakening that predator in yourself. Amazing. Okay. Um, as we wrap up, I'm going to ask you a few questions about yourself. Um, what would your friends say is one of your superpowers? Uh, my, I'm an autodidact, like I mentioned before, you know, I didn't go What's to that? college, uh, a self learner. So didactic, like to teach. So I, um, I teach myself. So I didn't, you know, I've had some amazing teachers over the years, but I, I didn't really go to high school, college, anything like that. So I kind of have like a junior high school education. Uh, I can take a new topic. It's a weird question because I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but the question sort of sets you up to self-praise, I guess. Yep. Um, I can take a topic and develop mastery much faster than what would be considered average. So, um, you know, if you, you put me in front of a new skill set, I have tools to acquire mastery and probably a, oh man, sometimes a third of what would be the normal route because, uh, because I go deep and I go fast and I, I don't have a lot of the hint. I don't have a lot of the breaks in place that people develop through good, good, um, rearing. Yeah. <laughs> so makes, makes perfect I mean? sense. Do you collect anything or have you ever collected anything? kind of collects skulls. Okay. Yeah, um, I do. Uh, as, as a way of honoring the, the presence of those animals that we've eaten here in the house. What book have you reread the most? Dune by Frank Herbert. I read it at least once a year, sometimes for the last decade. So I probably read it about 15 to 20 times. All right. Two more questions. What is your guilty pleasure? Chocolate all the time. But my wife, when she saw this question said, um, I don't feel guilty about any of my pleasures, which I thought was a great answer. But yeah. me, definitely. <laughs> That's awesome. And last question, we'll change things up a little bit. What one question would you like to ask me? Who, who does the research for your interviews? Because uh, I'm not used to somebody coming to the table with like intimate details that they've gleaned from things I've said over the years. I've got a, I've got a team. A good one. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> are you, uh, maybe one more. Um, are you, uh, are you enjoying, uh, the, uh, the world of television? Yeah. I mean, I'm on outdoor channel. It's like on the fringes of television yeah, uh, it counts. and, and they are, uh, incredible because they don't, uh, they don't get in the way of my process. I, I don't have a showrunner or I don't have this, you know, huge team. I get to do this I have like the cake and eat it too right now. I mean, I basically get to make this show with a very small team. Nobody really over, no oversight about it. Um, and, uh, and I can, I get to speak freely. It's amazing. They, they're incredible. So I'm loving it, but I can't speak to what, you know, the rest of the TV experience would be like. I have a feeling I would struggle because uh, I'm not really, uh, I'm a pretty defiant character. So if I had a lot of rules, I, I think it would be hard for me. You are, um, I've done 400 of these now and you are, you've done a thousand. So maybe that's why you're so good. Um, but uh, you are one of the most uh, articulate, um, well-spoken, uh, I'll say another way, um, interviews I've ever had. I mean, I truly uh -huh. like, I, I feel like you hijacked my brain and I didn't want you to let it go. Like I, I felt <laughs> like, I, I truly feel like I'm coming away from this interview a, a better person and more wow. understanding the world better. So thank you for that. That was beautiful. Really good. Flattery, no, man. Uh, flattery, no bullshit. You know? No bullshit. Thank I, I really, you. you're I really saying you're, that. you're hitting my high points. Those are, those are, the, that's the most meaningful praise. Thank you for me. It was, it was beautiful. You. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? Man, this is your one time being alive. It would be a shame to be at the end of your life and realize you hadn't um, actually got to know the world outside that built environment. So even if it's just taking a walk through your, your local park and maybe veering off the trail a little bit, I really, really recommend, especially at this transitional moment in history, that people start to engage the natural world because it is ultimately what we most of us are really looking for and we're trying to surrogate it with other things and those things will never be it. Um, because you need to have interactions with an intelligence greater than your own or other people. Amazing. We'll link everything up in the show notes. We'll have people go watch your show. Thank you for taking the time to do this with me. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.